But, but before we get to that, I want to let's let's just start because um, you, you've been uh, in it's, involved in the arguments going back and forth uh, regarding Ron Paul's candidacy, and I think there's a good uh, entree into at least some of these issues. Um, it, it seems even more uh, 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 moot now, uh, particularly after the recent revelations that I think, you know, dispel any doubt if there were those who had them, uh, yeah. just as to um, his involvement in these racist newsletters, that apparently it's very good business. Um, yeah. But uh, just just give me a sense of just uh, of uh, of your response to the uh, progressive in some quarters, embrace of Ron Paul. Right. Well, I mean, what's incredible to me about it, and I did write an essay that, that went you know, semi-viral about a week and a half ago about this, uh, is that you, know, you have progressive folks who are willing to overlook uh, not only 95% of this man's uh, platform, which is utterly reactionary, uh, but uh, and to do that all for the sake of you know the five percent uh, in which you know many of us on the left might agree with him, but they're willing to do so in spite of the fact that among the things that Ron Paul is worst on, you know, is the notion of basic civil rights enforcement. I mean, this is a guy who, when he looks at the old footage of civil rights protesters sitting on stools at the Woolworths or at the Five and Dime store or the Soda Fountain or whatever, uh, trying to get served in 1960 during the sit-ins, and then being hauled off of those seats by police who are enforcing the property rights of the white owners, he looks at that and says, hmm, well, the property owners are in the right. I mean, he ultimately is saying that they were correct for having those folks hauled off of chairs because the white man's property right outweighs the right of black people to be treated like human beings. Any progressive who is willing to say, yeah, you know, he's sort of a racist, but... Or, yeah, he's sort of a sexist but because he's also said, for instance, that you know, sexual harassment shouldn't even be illegal. If women are harassed, they should just quit their jobs and find another job. Anyone who's willing to overlook that and still call themselves progressive, uh, it really frightens me. It seems to me that if there's going to be a litmus test in this country uh, about what makes one progressive, uh, basic belief in civil rights protections and equal opportunity ought to be among them. And here's a guy who is very clearly on record as having said that the civil rights laws should never have been applied to private companies and that private business owners should be able to do whatever they wish because their rights are uh, paramount. Anyone who believes that, I just don't see how they can consider themselves progressive or anyone who would support someone like that, how they can consider themselves so. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the interesting thing about um, uh, Ron Paul and the, the sort of the, the aspect that gets glossed over, because I, I, I for one, um, uh, appreciate at least on one level his uh, call for civil liberties uh, in terms of, of what's happening with um, uh, things like the Patriot Act, uh, things sure. like um, uh, uh, the uh, NDAA, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. He has a he has no pro he has a problem if um, if if federal authorities are right. going into that lunchroom. He has no problem with state or local authorities uh, pulling black people out of uh, out of that right. lunchroom. Right. Well, not only that, not only that, but uh, you know, it, it, even his thing with the TSA. I mean, his son. You know, I live in Nashville, and his son Rand was you know, stopped and, and I guess, you know, was subjected or tried to be subjected to a pat down here at the Nashville airport last week. And, you know, it became this huge call of righteous indignation. Oh, my God, they're going to pat down a United States senator. And then Ron Paul, of course, raised money off of that. But what was interesting was that in his condemnation, you know, his, his position is not that we should not have tight security checks at airports that might even include that. He just wants, and he said it himself, he thinks airport security should be turned over to private right. companies. If those private companies decide that they want to do full-body, nude you know, picture scans and save the pictures for their own edification, if it's a private company, his answer would be, well, if you don't like it, don't fly, or start, a, start your own company and, and be more competitive than them, or you know, take the bus instead of going in the airplanes if you don't. I mean, what kind of, you know, he's, he's for civil liberties uh, in the abstract, this sense that he doesn't want the quote-unquote big bad federal government to intrude on our persons, but he doesn't care if a profit-making business does the same thing and leaves us with no choice but to be subjected to their whim. There's nothing remotely progressive about that. It also, I've never heard him complain about the tremendous, the experience of 
of, uh, of black men in the urban centers who they are subjected to that type of pat down, not for flying, but for walking on the sidewalk. I right, mean, right. <laughs> you know, right. And even, and even though, and even though he would say, as he did when he, you know, when he started getting criticized for the newsletters, now he's saying how anti-racist he is because he's against the war on drugs and the disproportionality of it toward black folks. So he would say, oh, but, but I do care about that. And yet the truth is, once again, his position is that the states ought to be able to make their own drug laws. The feds should basically get out of it. So he doesn't have a problem with perhaps 50 different wars on drugs, or, you know, as I said in the piece somewhat sarcastically, 49, you know, Vermont may legalize. So, you know, congratulations, hippies. You know, you can get, you can get high in Vermont. But, but everybody else, uh, where black folks actually live in large numbers, to think that they're not going to be harassed uh, by state or local police, that they're not going to be harassed by private security if things get privatized. I mean, it's absurd. His, his concerns over these issues, and I think progressives need to understand this, is far less about some principled opposition to dehumanization, some principled opposition to the mistreatment of people on the basis of color, and simply more about this sort of somewhat slavish devotion to this Ayn Randian objectivist, the individual is all, and, you know, the, the state should not do this. But he really doesn't care uh, whether, you know, smaller government officials at the local right. level do those things or whether private companies do. Right. He's more of an anti-federalist, I think, than a civil libertarian in my estimation. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, you know, and I don't know that I necessarily... Um, Agree with the concept of a litmus test in this context, and and I'll tell you why. Because I want it because I, because I know that you um, you know I've listened to some recent interviews you've done. Um, uh, you had a great interview, and I think uh, we we've, we've either linked or posted to um, the uh, the interview you did uh, on blacking it up. Yeah. Uh, and you know I think the the value of Ron Paul it, it, it's a very complicated uh, a question I think to a certain extent because I do um, I, I do understand why people are promoting at the very least his positions relative to President Obama's when it comes to uh, Empire uh, right. his promotion his his at least the narrow f playing field that he uh, allows for himself in talking about civil liberties uh, right. in, in context to President Obama. Uh, and then, you know, the, the question becomes, like, you, you've said in the past that, uh, that, that President Obama has really required, as I think all leaders do, uh, yeah. that progressives make him do more things. Uh, expand on that a little bit, because I want to head into that, because I think to a certain extent, the yeah. promotion of Ron Paul's positions on some level, uh, I don't think he's the best spokesperson for it. I don't know why people aren't sure. promoting Rocky Anderson, let's say, in that context. Right. Sure. Sure. Uh, but um, is sort of meant in some way, I think, to do that very thing, to push President Obama in a certain direction. Well, and the only thing I think we need to recognize is that, it, you know, in the case of Ron Paul's a handful of positions that we can call progressive, it's not working. I mean, the reality is the president is not responding to this candidacy, which is not going anywhere, by saying, oh, I really should rethink those drone attacks, or yeah, you know, I really might ought to rethink uh, policy in the Middle East, or gee, yeah, I really should stop the war on drugs. It's not happening. You know, when Ron Paul brought those things up, there's just like silence in the debate halls, and then they go on to something else. That doesn't mean you can't push the president to those places, but I doubt very seriously, that uh, President Obama is going to be pushed to a more progressive place by someone who stands far, far, far to his right on 95% of all issues. If that's going to happen, it's going to have to happen from his left. And a good example of that, although I think there are flaws and there are problems and all kinds of things in the movement that need to be worked out, the one thing that Occupy has done since going back, you know, to September when it really kicked off, is that there has been, I think, uh, in the for the first time in many years that I can recall, the inculcation of this discussion about income and wealth inequality among presidential candidates. I mean, Obama himself has spoken about it in recent months, not as much as I'd like him to, and not, you know, with sort of the intentionality about what's going to be done about it. But even the fact that that narrative is starting to become more popular, so much so that even Mitt Romney, uh, what, like five weeks ago, made the statement statement, which was pretty laughable, but he still made it. You know, I'm not a typical Wall Street guy. Well, what does that mean? And would he have said it four years ago? Well, he didn't. Would he have said it a year and a half ago? Well, he didn't. And so it says to me that if we want someone to move left, we have to not really so much push them as pull them there. Um, I think that's far more likely. So instead of relying on Ron Paul 
difficult to raise these handful of legitimate issues. We should be absolutely appalled that he's the one who's getting the most traction for them when it should be our job to do it. Whether or not it'll work, we don't know, but it is our job uh, as progressive and, and radical folks to raise those, those subjects. Right. I mean, I agree with that. I think uh, Corey uh, Robin had a piece suggesting that um, – the the emergence of Ron Paul as the only spokesperson on the left, you know, supposedly carrying this banner on the left is is uh, problematic because of who he is, but it's also problematic insofar as there's no one else on the left who's raising those issues. Well, I mean, there are people, of course. I mean, the Congressional Black Caucus has raised them for years. Lots of folks on the left of the of the uh, Congressional, you know, the Progressive Caucus, and those folks have done it. Now, they don't get the attention. And, of course, in part, that's because Ron Paul's running for president. I suppose if it were a Democratic primary and, and Kucinich were running or Bernie Sanders were running or something, you know, someone who was clearly to the left, um, then maybe it would be. But in lieu of that, you know, the reality is we've got to – take that dialogue back because otherwise it gets associated with the kind of fringy thinking that Ron Paul is so famous for in every other area. You know, it's like everybody hears us talking about, you know, uh, drone strikes or hears us talking about the war on drugs and they think, oh yeah, they probably want to, you know, go back to the gold standard and you know, a bunch of other sort of pseudo-conspiratorial things that, that Ron Paul believes in. So, you know, it's incumbent upon us to not really praise him for raising the issue because I think that just strengthens libertarianism and he himself. But I think we've got to just say, look, we've been out here saying this stuff for many, many years, and, and now that this guy's saying it, we just want to remind you whose agenda this is. It's not the Libertarian Party. It's not the Republican Party. It's not conservatives. You know, it's the left.